So uh, my name is Phil Sancher. I'm Vice President of Business Development here at Ann Arbor Spark. Uh, we're a regional economic development organization dedicated to growing the Ann Arbor uh, economy. Um, in economic development these days, we often talk about uh, talent being probably the biggest driver um, of, of really of needs that uh, companies in our community have. Uh, and so it's a question that we think a lot about and uh, actively work uh, with companies to help address. And uh, when it comes to thinking through that question, we know that um, culture is an extremely important part of it and that there's some companies that quote unquote get it and some that don't. And when it comes to that topic, we've got a great resource uh, literally in Spark's backyard uh, with Rich Sheridan and Menlo Innovations. Uh, and we wanted to take an opportunity to have Rich come in and talk a little bit about uh, his approach to that question and uh, do a little bit of, of learning related to that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over here in a couple minutes to, uh, to Rich. I just wanted to do a quick housekeeping since I don't think that point was taken. If you have a question for Rich, uh, please put it into the, uh, the question box that you should have on the, the webinar tool and uh, we'll get to those towards the end so that we have a little bit of Q&A uh, after we get through some of the material here. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to, to Rich. Um, and I, for those of you that don't know Rich Sheridan, um, he's, in my mind, he's, a, he's an Ann Arbor institution. Uh, it's been around, it's, it's, it's rare, I feel like, for Rich to not know somebody or know something that's going on in the community. Uh, and, and for me, in the work that we do in terms of interacting with uh, folks that are not part of Ann Arbor or from outside of the area, um, Rich and, and really uh, his work with Joy Inc. has become part of the sort of business canon that we have uh, with the business community here. So we always like to say that, that Ann Arbor is more than just uh, the great educational institutions that we have in town. It's our, our business community is, is really critical uh, and Rich is really an important part of that. So uh, next voice you hear will be Rich Sheridan, who I'm going to let take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> Probably not surprising that a guy who runs a software firm would run into a technical difficulty with the presentation. So uh, I'm sure all of us can relate to uh, the anxiety around electronic presentations. So it's great to be here, and I'm happy to share a message around uh, this idea of building a culture focused on what we like to call a Menlo, the business value of joy. And for us, um, there's some very specific intention behind that, and it certainly drives the talent Part of our organization. So as you can see from the title slide here, uh, the guy who wrote the book on joy is going to talk to you a little bit about fear today and the role, quite frankly, that fear can play in our organizations and, uh, and the negative consequences it can affect and how do we overcome that? Because uh, if you look at uh, some of the more famous cultural companies, uh, one of the uh, probably one that gets a lot of attention is Google, and they've actually turned the lens inside on themselves and tried to figure out how do we how do we succeed as a company? And they had a lot of formulas in the past. They started questioning their own formulas, and they finally came out with a report that I thought was pretty significant. And they said that um, the highest performing teams and the best way to recruit in their organization is to build a culture of psychological safety. And I think safety and fear go hand in hand. So I want to talk about how we did that at Menlo, uh, intrigue you with a few stories about our culture and some other stories that I've collected along the way, uh, to give you a mindset that says we might have to change. There might be some significant things we can do, and where would we start? So uh, this, for me, actually started in my own career, where I got started in the software industry at a very young age. I started writing code when I was 13 years old, way back in 1971. Uh, yes, in fact, there were computers back in 1971. Um, and I thought, boy, this is going to be the coolest profession ever. I was so excited, and, uh, and I realized, holy cow, uh, I've, I'm onto something. This is going to be great. Uh, Eventually came up here to the University of Michigan, got a couple of degrees in computer science and computer engineering, launched a career right here in town. This is a great town to be in the technology industry. I've enjoyed my uh, uh, long career now, now that I'm an institution, as Phil says. Uh, and, um, uh, but I can tell you very quickly, my life ran from joy to fear. I started spending lots of time away from family, uh, working late nights. The uh, IT industry is often famous for a death march culture. 
And, uh, and I was inside of that, and I was actively contemplating getting out. Uh, given the book I've written and the company we've created since then, I get pulled into a lot of, uh, a lot of other companies. They bring me in. I actually get to travel all over the world now. Sometimes it's very specific. I come into other companies. And there was one uh, chief technology officer that brought me into his company down south as a health insurance provider. And he said, Rich, I want to learn more about what you've done because we're having problems here ourselves. And we had a big miss. We had a big deadline due in November. We missed by a country mile. We uh, delivered really poor quality to our customers. And quite frankly, this is my my boss told me, uh, you better get it right the next time or else. I asked him, or else what? And he said, well, he wasn't specific, but I think you know what he means, Rich. And he said, we got another delivery coming up in April, and that was the one we had to make. He said, so tell me, how'd you do it, Rich? How did you get from where you were, that fearful place, back to, back to joy? And I said, well, we created a culture based on making mistakes faster. And that was a surprise to him. He told me, Rich, I don't want to make any mistakes. That's why you're here. That's what I want to talk about. And I said, well, his name was Todd. I said, Todd, this isn't about not making mistakes, and this isn't about making mistakes. This is about making them quickly so we can correct them while they're still small. We create an environment for our teams where small mistakes can be discovered and corrected quickly. We can start to energize the team, and that can be a very attractive force to your culture. That can be one where... People want to join. They want to be part of it because we are going to make mistakes. We're human. And, uh, and as leaders, and, and I really want to speak to the people who are recruiting, who are trying to build their teams, trying to lead their teams, trying to manage their teams, I think the thing we have to face as leaders is it is our job to create that safe environment for our teams. That's where we lead. And I give a lot of tours of Menlo. We had almost 4,000 people come through our doors last year alone from all over the world just to see what it is we've created and dig in and stay anywhere from two hours to five days. We were just on Tech Trek uh, tour the other day. We had 680 people come through just for that alone. And when people ask me about our culture and they say, what, what's the basics of your culture here, Rich? I point up at the HVAC uh, system in the ceiling. This is an actual HVAC unit in the Menlo space kind of in a cavernous basement, and uh, this is up in the ceiling. And I say, there it is right there. That's a metaphor for our culture. If you think of an HVAC system, it pumps cold air out, filters out dust particles, warms the air up to a nice safe temperature, pumps that, that nice uh, heated air back into the room. If you think about a culture as leaders, if we operate like this, we pump fear out of the room, we filter out ambiguity, we create an environment that feels nice and safe and pump that safety back into the room. If people feel safe at work, psychologically safe, as the Google report talks about, they will begin to trust one another. And in that trust, collaboration and teamwork will begin to form. And quite frankly, then you get to the thing that everybody wants, your staff and you and your customers. They want invention. They want creativity. They want imagination. They want innovation. And if we get that kind of environment going, that becomes a very attractive force, not only for your team, but for the customers that you're trying to attract. So it's one of the interesting aspects of working on your culture to attract a good team. Uh, that will spill out over into your marketing effects for your company. And we've certainly seen that at Menlo. But of course, this means change. Guessing uh, people are listening to this because they're looking for new ideas. They're looking for new ways of approaching things. And change is so hard. One of the biggest challenges to change is trying to overcome the way you've always done things, that sunk cost thinking of when you start thinking about changing something. You're like, yeah, but we're, we're so invested in the current way we do things. Well, that's in the past. You have to start thinking about the future. And, uh, you know, once you start, once you overcome that sort of deadly paralysis of sunk cost thinking, now you're, you know, you're confronted with something really scary. Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to try? What if it doesn't work? Uh, and so you have to now overcome that fear of actually making a change that sticks. And then let's say you make a change and it isn't working well. Now you got to come over a different fear. Well, we're, now we've changed. we got to stick with the change, don't we? And so there's a lot of fear inside of this. There's no question about it. And this is why I believe this kind of fundamental behavior changes. Well, it's a fundamental act of leadership. 
And inside of all this, quite frankly, the person who had to change first was me. I had to think of a different way of doing things than was customary. I was brought up a certain way, and I can tell you I was led with fear. I had uh, early bosses in my life that believed that motivating people with fear was the best way to get the, the most results out of a team. But there is a significant cost to that kind of fear that attempts to motivate a team artificially, tries to motivate them with uh, oh simple phrases like, how's it going? What you working on? Are you staying this weekend? Are you almost done? Or just uh, management by walking around and annoying people. There's, uh, there is a significant cost to this kind of artificial fear. Uh, and sometimes it leads to incredible negative consequences. And uh, I'm just going to read a little section out of my book here of the cost of artificial fear. Roger and Boisley, a former insider of Morton Thiokol Incorporated, the maker of the infamous booster rockets and suspect O-rings that led to the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger, offered the following thoughtful analysis of artificial fear at that company. Many opportunities, he said, were available to structure the workforce for corrective action, but the Morton Thiokol management team would not let anything compete or interfere with the production and shipping of boosters. When we create environments of artificial fear inside of our organization, it paralyzes our team into never raising their hand, never saying anything, or if they do, get shut down quickly. And the trouble with that kind of artificial fear is it can have disastrous consequences for your company and, quite frankly, for your team and their morale. Obviously, uh, most of us will never experience the kind of tragedy that the Space Shuttle Challenger exhibited, but um, fear does kill. Fear does kill projects. It kills products, it kills departments, it kills morale, kills the spirit and energy that keeps your team coming in every day. So we have to keep that kind of fear in check. But everybody wonders, if you just pull out all the fear, Rich, you create this nice, safer environment, what happens to accountability? Will people still deliver results? Is it still going to be the kind of company that, that grows and that achieves competitive advantage and market share and that sort of thing? And I was down at a company in Atlanta one time, and uh, somebody was hearing me talk about our culture at Menlo, and they said, but Rich, tell me about accountability. And I could feel all the executives in the room kind of straighten up their spines and smile a little grin and say, yeah, yeah, we want to hear about accountability. You know, that's a, that's a word just filled with fear, isn't it? And um, I said, well, let me tell you how accountability works at Menlo. And I said, the first thing is I deliver accountability to my team. And they all got quiet, and they wondered what I was talking about. And I said, well, let's, let's talk about estimation, for example. You know, our team decides how much time they think they need for something. And, of course, if in accountability fashion, you'd like them to always hit their, their estimates. But I told them, I said, the first thing I deliver in terms of accountability to my team is that they're safe. If they made a mistake, that's okay. We'll try better next time. Uh, you know, that I want to make it safe for them to make the guesses, the intelligent guesses they can about estimation, but in some ways make sure I remove, remove enough fear that they're not trying to inflate their estimates just to cover their butts uh, and always get things done because that actually diminishes the performance of your team. And I can tell you at this point, one of these guys stood up in the room, a VP of marketing, and he thrusts his finger out at me across the room, and he says, well, this is bull. He says, let me tell you about how accountability works at our company. And I said, okay. And everybody was quiet, including the CEO who was in the room, and he said, accountability around here is you say you're going to do something by Friday, you're going to get it done by Friday or else, or else you're staying the weekend. I don't care if the next day is Christmas or your kid's birthday, you're staying. I said, oh, interesting. I said, so imagine I change my company to work like that. What do you think would happen? It was interesting watching the change of expression on his face. I felt like every cell in his body changed. He says, well, he says, here's what I think will happen. People will start lying about being done. They'll brush quality problems under the rug where nobody can find them. You'll start delivering sub-quality product to the marketplace. You'll demoralize your team. They'll begin to quit on you. They will... Uh, you will start to lose market share. You will start to suffer in the marketplace, both for recruiting talent and for recruiting customers. He says, Rich, you'll have, in fact, at your company exactly what we have at ours. 
and he got it. He understood that he was part of the problem, that as a leader, he needed to change his attitude towards his team. Now, I can tell you, by delivering that kind of accountability to my team, I can ask for something really important in return. I can ask for information. If things aren't going right, share that. We thank them when they do that. We smile and we thank them when they do that. We've learned to, to have in those crucial moments a vital behavior that says we care about you as a person. We know you tried to do the best thing you could. I would appreciate you sharing information with us. Now what can we do about it? This goes back to the make mistakes faster philosophy. We do a lot of crazy things like this at Menlo. We plan with paper. People often refer to us as the Amish of software development when we do this. Uh, we use simple tools that invite participation. Uh, we keep things simple so that people aren't getting confounded by the, by the tools themselves. Um, and I want to leave you with one story. And I think it's an important one. As you think about the changes you want, want, might want to make in your culture, perhaps you'll read my book, you'll read books by somebody else, you'll attend a seminar, you'll go visit somebody, you'll go to a conference, you come away with an idea. And I know what happens in those circumstances. You know, you get all fired up. You, you read a book, you wake up in the morning, you run into the office the next day, and you grab the first person you see who doesn't, hasn't read what you've read, hasn't thought what you've thought, and you grab me and say, I got this great idea. And you tell it to them, and they look you in the eye, and they say, yeah, that won't work here. That's not us. That's not our culture. That's not how things work around here. You, you won't get approval for that. And right then and there, you know it. The idea dies because you've got emails to answer. You've got meetings to go to. The idea dies. I want to arm you with one simple phrase. Take nothing else away from this talk. Take this away. Look them in the eye. Shrug your shoulders. Say, yeah, I know. But let's run the experiment. Let's try something and see what happens. It's amazing how effective that simple phrase can be in creating the kind of change you need in your organization, kind of change that improves your culture, kind of change that improves your behavior as a leader, as an organization, the kind of organization that now attracts the talent you want to attract and attracts the customers you want to attract. I'll give you one of our more famous experiments at Menlo. Nine years ago, Tracy had little Maggie. She was off for a few months of maternity leave. She was ready to come back to work. She came up to me and she said, Rich, I've got a challenge. We can't get Maggie into the daycare we want to use. They're full. Grandparents live too far away to help. My husband, John, and I don't know what to do. And uh, I can tell you in that moment, there was a screaming match going on in my head that Tracy never heard. Uh, the dark voice was yelling in my ear saying, don't you dare say what you're about to say. HR will kill you. The lawyers will freak out. The insurance policies will go through the roof. And the bright voice said, you're an entrepreneur, Rich. It's your company. You can do whatever you want. You don't even have an HR department. And uh, I looked at Tracy and I said, bring her in. She said, what do you mean? I said, bring her into work. She paused, bewildered. She looked at me and she said, all day? I said, sure. She said, every day? <laughs> I said, why not? And she looked around the room and she said, Rich, we're in a big open office space. There's no private offices at Menlo. And she said, where will I put her? I said, she's a baby. She's not going anywhere. Just put her in a bassinet in the floor wherever you're working. She goes, well, what if she makes a fuss? Well, in our big open room, it's like a noisy restaurant. I said, Tracy, we won't even hear her. She goes, come on, Rich, you know. There's this big baby fuss. Now, what was Tracy doing? She, was, she, she probably was intrigued, but she's throwing up all these barriers. Finally, I looked at her and I said, Tracy, you're the mom. I trust you. You'll do the right thing. We'll work it out together. Let's run the experiment. Well, I can tell you that has worked out incredibly well. You know, you see that baby on the screen. That's a cute little one, isn't it? Funny thing is, that's not Maggie. That's Ellie. That's Menlo baby number nine. We actually just uh, graduated Menlo baby number 13 and Menlo baby number 14 arrived last Friday. So this has been a wonderful experiment. Now I can tell you when you run experiments, there's something you have to know. You have to expect the unexpected. That's why we call them experiments. Things are going to happen that you weren't expecting. So you have to be ready to deal with them. For example, little Ellie learned to pair program. Ellie went to design meetings. Uh, when the babies fussed, and of course they did, they're babies, what we didn't expect was the team's response. The team, instead of objecting to the noise of a baby in the room, asked to help. 
they would rush and say, no, it's my turn to hold the baby. So these babies, these 13 little babies in the last nine years and soon to be number 14 have been raised by the village. This is uh, Henry coming back for a visit, visiting with Tracy, Menlo mom number one. Henry was Menlo baby number seven. And Fern the dog decided to stick his nose in there. And I can tell you we found out one other thing that was even more significant. We found out that our customers behave better when you bring a baby to the meeting. They actually delight in our culture. They, they start to think we're pretty cool. And, uh, and you can imagine this kind of feature, and I'm not saying that this is what you should do at your company because there are certainly companies where babies would not be appropriate. So don't beat yourself up if you can't do this where you work. But understand that when your customers start to delight in your culture, that's an upward spiral of morale, not only for you, but for your team and for the people who interact with you. Because I can tell you these kind of moments, this is John with Henry, are just joyful. This is actually John's son, Henry. John was one of the Menlo dads that would uh, bring in his son. John's actually brought in both Henry and Lucy, his two children. Now, I will also tell you, if you are intrigued with the idea of allowing babies in the workplace, come and talk to us. We've got some ideas. We, we've done some things over the years to support this program. But understand, this is not a daycare. The child is essentially with the parent all day long unless the team helps. So um, it's a different kind of approach, but boy, you want to talk about an approach that builds loyalty with your team members. This is a significant one. And, you know, it's an early training program. This is Henry learning to manage here. He's going around saying, ask people, how's it going? What you working on? <laughs> um, and then one other thing, uh, and this was an interesting other aspect of our culture. We've always allowed dogs in our place. We actually have a lease that allows up to three dogs in our space. Who knew you could put that in a lease? Um, and uh, But the gentleman in the orange shirt came in for one of our traditional weekly show and tells, and he called ahead of time and he said to me, he says, Rich, do you mind if I bring Buster in to show and tell with me? And I said, sure, who's Buster? And he says, my great Dane. So this is Buster, gentle giant that he is. He'd come into the office and put his paws on my shoulders and be taller than me, and I'm six foot five. Um, but what I realized in this story was that our customers were choosing to behave like us. Michael couldn't actually bring his dogs into where he worked. It wouldn't be appropriate. That's not the kind of business that would allow dogs for good reason. Again, dogs are no dogs, babies are no babies does not define your culture. It's the fact that if you can do things like this and you try them, how do they work out? But what Michael was saying was, I want to be like you when I'm with you. I want to join your culture. I can tell you, when you start creating a culture that's attractive enough, not just for the people you're trying to recruit, but for the customers that you're trying to gain, you've created a very powerful aligned culture indeed. So I would just recommend breaking through that veil, that veil that prevents change. It's often an invisible veil. It feels like it's real. It feels like it's a wall that's there. With that one simple phrase, run the experiment. Just try it. See what happens. You'll be surprised. I want to thank you for uh, inviting me into your lives today. I hope uh, this was helpful to you in getting you started on your ideas. I'm happy to take questions. Now, we've created a special landing page for you here. If you want to download copies of these slides or learn more about Menlo, you can just click on the link on this particular slide. Thanks for having me. Rich, um, can you talk, I'm, I'm going to ask a little bit of a tactical question, but when, when Menlo is doing your talent acquisition or you've got an, an open opportunity, how do you guys go through that process and, and why do you think that is a little, a little different than the norm? Yeah, so what we decided to do, Phil, at the very beginning of Menlo was open our doors to the world for tours. And we do a couple of free tours a month, so anybody can come. There's no cost to those. We also do paid tours. Um, and people come from all over the world to just see us. Well, what we discovered, because we thought this was just darn good marketing, you know, come in, see us, learn about us, figure that out. But we found that people would start to surreptitiously join these tours who thought maybe Menlo was the kind of place they might like to work. But let's hear how Menlo talks about themselves when they're talking to potential customers. And uh, so we started getting these visitors coming in who afterwards would say, I want to work here. And so we realized that tours was not only a powerful, attractive marketing force, but it was also a powerfully attractive recruiting tool. Uh, actually, delightfully, one of the aspects of those tours is that uh, parents would come. 
uh, and they would offer us their children. And I'm not talking about little kids. You know, the parents, executives of various companies would say, hey, my kid just graduated from college. I know they would love to work at a place like this. Can I have you, can I have them send you your resume? Uh, and that just really folds into a, a key point that I want to make sure I encourage your audience along. And that is what people look for these days is alignment. Alignment around an authentic message about your culture. Um, you know, there, I always say there's three data points in the life of the company. What's the world's outside perception of you? You know, people who don't know you but have never been to see you, they have an impression. You know, it was gathered in one way, shape, form, or another. And there's that outside impression. Um, then there's an inside reality. What's it like to work there? And, you know, especially when you're not the co-founder. What's it like for the life of an employee? Um, and then there's the heart of the vision of the visionary leader of the company, the entrepreneur, the co-founder, that sort of thing. Typically, those three data points, outside perception, inside reality, and heart of the visionary leader, they're not in alignment. And people smoke that out pretty quickly. Uh, if, if your culture is not in alignment on those fronts, if you would not want to share your inside reality with the world the way we do, then I would suggest you've got to get to work doing some of those changes I talked about to change your inside reality. Because that's what people are looking for these days. Um, fair point. So I think, um, at least my assumption is that uh, I think the software industry and in, as in, in, as a whole has been really effective in able to these talent types questions, some of these cultural related questions. And I think there is an assumption from some folks out there that it's doesn't work perhaps in other types of industries that don't have the same dynamics that a, a software industry does. Do you think that's a fair assumption? And if not, why? You know, I, well, I think every company uh, has a talent issue, regardless of how ubiquitous the resources are that they could draw in. And we all want to build a company. I, you know, let me just step aside just for a second and talk about culture in general. I think there's two kinds of culture that are out there. One is intentional, something you see at Menlo. We're very intentional, very clear. Everybody you talk to at Menlo knows what our cultural goals are, what our cultural intentions are, and how we foster all that. Then there's the default culture. Who did we hire? What behaviors do we tolerate? What attitudes walked in the door today? Um, any company that doesn't focus on its culture, regardless of industry, will result in that default behavior. And it can work for a long time, but one day it doesn't and nobody knows why. It goes off the track and we can't get it back on track. And maybe it was a couple of strong personalities in the room, but because it wasn't intentional, nobody knows how to get things back on track and things start to go awry. Relationships start to devolve inside the organization. People get upset. Some of them quit. Some of them that should quit stay, all that sort of thing. So I think every company is faced with that. And quite frankly, I mean, the competitive landscape in any industry today is such that um, if you're not building that safe learning organization, you're probably falling behind. Your industry, uh, we just had uh, uh, Caterpillar in at Menlo yesterday. They make that big equipment, you know, those big, you know, earth-moving equipment. And you think, well, there's an industry that's about the opposite of software, but I can tell you, I can assure you from the conversation I've had with them, there's software everywhere in their industry as well. So, um, so if the messaging is run, run the experiment, um, maybe I'll have a, a, tactical, uh, a tact question here. If, uh, if maybe there are certain folks that might be, don't want to take the step of letting babies into the office just yet, <laughs> uh, is, there, is there an experiment or maybe some ideas on the experiment or of experiments that could be run that might be a little bit lower, more <laughs> pressure than that, or where is there a, a Sure. Well, you know, yeah, the problem with the baby experiment is you first have to have a baby, oh, uh, so that can take a little while all by itself. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think what I see people take away from Menlo is some of the simpler things. And again, I, I want to be very clear, even when people come visit Menlo, I don't ever say to anybody, you should try and make your company look like mine. That's not the point. What, what a lot of people are coming to visit just want to see a living, breathing example. And quite frankly, any of your listeners can come in and visit us and, and see it for themselves. But um, what I think is fundamental to all of this is Run small, inexpensive experiments because one of the troubles with running experiments that's too expensive is there is reluctance 
because of that sunk cost mentality I talked about. Like, oh no, it's, it's got to work. We spend so much money on it. A lot of people like change their physical offices, for example, and then find out it doesn't work. And a lot of people come to Menlo and they see, oh, look at their big open office environment, and you know. But there's all these articles that say those don't work. You know, they, they've got data that proves they don't work, and yet it seemingly works for us. And I tell them, they said, we didn't build an open office environment. We built an open culture. And the office is a reflection of our culture. Well, we had one company come in from the East Coast, and they took that to heart. And what they did, and this is, again, just an example of a small experiment you can run, see how it works. They went back to their office. These were the executives. This was chief operating officer and his various VPs. And they moved out of their office. So they just pulled their desks out, put them out into the big space in front of their offices, put signs on their office doors saying, these are conference rooms now. You can book it. If they needed private time, they could book the conference room themselves. they got lots of conference rooms now because they all moved out. And they just sat around some table together. And they said the camaraderie that was forming just among the executives themselves, but the message it was speaking out to the team was very, very important. I've seen that kind of move over and over again where, you know, I can tell you a lot of times, you know, if executives say, well, hey, Phil, you need to change, you know, but I'm, but I'm fine. I, got, I can stay just the same, you know. Uh, but when the executives started leading the change, it started to affect their team in a pretty dramatic way. And that's a pretty inexpensive experiment. Good. Um, well, I think that uh, I'm taking a look here. Um, we're ahead of schedule, so that's good. Um, I think from a, a follow-up perspective, what we'll do is we'll send you out, and obviously, Rich mentioned that there's the landing page that you can go to to get the slides. Um, there's also an overview, I think, of a really helpful um, visual of, uh, of Menlo. If you haven't had a chance to, to check out the space yet, um, kind of gives you a sense of what that's like. Uh, and then if you're open to it, we'll be able to invite folks in as well, I would think. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so we'll send that out as a uh, as a follow up, and uh, I guess I'll, I want to thank Rich for your time and uh, your expertise on this uh, on this topic, and uh, thanks everyone for attending as well. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, I guess we'll uh, we'll shut it down. Thanks, guys. <laughs>